Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Daniel, uh, Su- how'd you say it again? It was uh, Suazo? Su- Suazo. Suazo, okay, Suazo. Daniel Suazo. Uh, so he is known on YouTube as the Jewish Catholic. And man, uh, what was it? Uh, you commented under the video that I recently did debating whether or not Christ established an infallible magisterium. And you know that the comment uh, that the comment was so awesome, and I wanted to reach out to you because my sister she introduced me to your work. Some people online introduced me to your work, and everyone was saying like Swan, like you're talking mm-hmm. about the Jewish roots of Christianity and particularly Catholicism. Like you got to get this guy on. And so man, <laughs> like you, what is it? Uh, you, you, and we were talking before we started that um, when I did my video on the papacy with Matt Frad, you also did yeah. a video on like uh, Eliakim, right, in the Old Testament yes. and the papacy in Peter. So, yeah, man, I mean, Daniel, uh, how about you introduce yourself a little bit, like, you know, the the podcast that you're doing and the work and so on and so forth. Absolutely. First of all, I just want to thank you, Swan, for having me here on your podcast. I'm super excited to be able to chat with you. Uh, For all of those of you who may not know me, my name again is Daniel. And my channel, you can find me on YouTube and on Instagram, both under the same name, which is The Jewish Catholic. And I began my YouTube channel journey, if you will, a couple of years back talking about my journey in the faith. And I actually didn't start in Catholicism, but that's where the Lord has led me. And I'm super excited to share more about that too today. Yeah. And so the subject of today's episode is just talking to Daniel about his testimony, his journey from uh, from Judaism to Catholicism. And also, you know, we might get into a little bit about um, you know, particular Catholic doctrines and beliefs, and even, you know, how, how your life has been shaped by being Catholic and being, you know, a very devout Jewish uh, person. Mm. And so, Daniel, uh, let's just start off by, you know, your childhood and your, your upbringing, right? So sure. you didn't start off Catholic, so I'm guessing you started no. off uh, Jewish? <laughs> well, this is the interesting part. So my family itself has been Jewish for as far as we can go back in our history, right? But It's a very muddy history because we come from what are known as the conversos, which are the Sephardic Jews, the Jews from Spain and Northern Africa, that many of them came and either they converted to Christianity or they were what are known as hidden Jews. Mm. So that's where my family comes in. They were part of this very small community of Jewish people in Central America. Um, And a lot of my family didn't even know about this either as they started mixing with the crowds around them. But then my dad, I remember one time we were talking and he used to tell me him and his friends would hang out at the Jewish cemetery when they were kids. And he said that it was always weird that you know, him and his friends would be there because everybody else would think that that was weird. But that's the only place that really ties us back down to the Jewish roots in the family. And now that same Jewish community has started to bud again, and it's growing. So even though my family's heritage is Jewish, they didn't really practice anything when they were children. They believed in God in a very abstract way. And from there, they ended up moving to the States, which is where I was born. I was born in the Bronx, New York. Shout out to people in New York. And after that, they ended up becoming Pentecostal Christian out of all things, which was completely drastic change, right? But that's what comes when they weren't even practicing anything. So again, my family is Jewish, but they started walking in the way of Pentecostal Christianity. And then later on, I don't know how much you want me to dive into right now, but um, that led me slowly into going back to my Jewish roots and I became part of the Messianic Jewish movement. And then later from that, about two years ago, I ended up where I am now pursuing Orthodox Catholicism. So I don't know if you have any questions or I can dive into the whole deep story on how that happened. Well, you know, actually, I do have a few questions, right? So you know, when your family becomes Pentecostal Christian, so did they, you know, like when they when they joined, um, you know, that denomination, did they actually believe at that moment that Jesus was the Messiah? Or was it more like they really liked the community? They liked the environment? Or did, did they really mm-hmm. assent to the teaching of, yeah. of at least, you know, Christianity? Good question. So because they were not really following anything, um, I, I guess you could say my great grandparents were the more religious ones but my dad and my mom they they were in the very same neighborhood they've known each other since they were 14 years old and everybody knows each other in that small town um 
but almost none of the young people and their parents were practicing anything. They just believed that God existed. That's it. Uh, when my dad got to New York, he went first and then my mom followed. And I think what really attracted them to Christianity was the fact, number one, that the guy who hired my dad and gave my dad his first real job in New York was a pastor. It was that very same Pentecostal pastor. And since they had this working relationship for so long, you know, they started building a friendship. And I think that slowly started to pull my dad in. He said, wow, this guy's great. He's so kind. He's hardworking. He's given me a home, essentially. And they actually ended up, since my dad was looking for a place to live, they gave my dad the apartment that was right above the building of the church. So it was the same building, but they let my dad live in there. So I think it kind of all started tying in because they were so helpful and kind to him. And that led him into really giving his life to the Messiah, Yeshua. Um, I don't know if in the beginning it was anything that convicted him like, wow, Jesus is the Messiah. I think it was just more the people um, that started to attract them. And then later on, he definitely ended up falling in love with God and Jesus and the scriptures. Um, and he became really passionate for that. And so like, you know, growing up, did you ever also have to deal with, um, you know, anti-Semitism or even even from Christians? Because I've heard, um, you know, from a lot of my Jewish friends or just, you know, mm -hmm. Jews online and rabbis that they've talked about, like growing up, they had to be so aware that Christians yeah. were anti-Semitic and blamed them mm -hmm. for the death of Jesus and, and the <sighs> apostles and so on and so forth. And so what was that like yeah. for you? If, did you experience well, that? Because when I already came into the picture, my parents were Pentecostal Christian. I didn't even know that I was Jewish when I was a little kid. I didn't even know my parents were from Central America. My parents completely closed down everything for me in regards to where we came from. So even my own parents, that's how wild it was. Even my own parents' country of birth was unknown to me. I was raised in Puerto Rico. I was born in the Bronx, and then we moved to Puerto Rico. We lived there for, I want to say, eight years, right? So during the time that I was living in Puerto Rico, again, I didn't know my background, and my parents had a different accent than I did in, in Spanish, right? They spoke a mix of a Central American accent with a little bit of Caribbean style Puerto Rican accent. My accent was completely Puerto Rican and I thought I was Puerto Rican. I didn't even know I was born in New York until later on, we go back to New York and we lived in Brooklyn, which is a very, very Jewish place, but it's, it's filled with uh, Haredim, which is basically the Orthodox Jews that everybody would recognize as the ones that have the peyot, which are the little locks on the sides, wearing all black, the big hat, uh, going to synagogue every Shabbat. Those are the people that I was surrounded with, but we couldn't relate because my parents now as believers in Jesus and seeing this very drastic movement that some of them actually believed in a Messiah. Um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, there is a famous Jewish rabbi that was based right there in Brooklyn. Um, Sneerson, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. And some people within that Haredi community believe that he is the Messiah, even though he died and has not resurrected <laughs> like our Messiah. Um, but so it wouldn't mix and they wouldn't consider me Jewish anyway, because my family um, was now Christian, right? When I became part of the Messianic Jewish movement, so I'll explain how I ended up there in a little bit. But when I was part of the Messianic Jewish movement, uh, then I looked more Jewish because I was wearing a kippah. I was wearing the tzitzit, which um, in case for anybody that doesn't know, it's the little strings that you see dangling around the waist of a Jewish person. Those are called tzitzit or tzitziot in the plural. And those come from the book of Numbers, chapter 15, around verse 45, uh, which are basically tassel garments that you wear. When people see me like this and they see me going to synagogue and see me wearing the Star of David and things like that, that's when people start saying, oh, guy, this guy's a Jew. At that point, there were times that I felt anti-Semitic um, sentiments, if you will, from certain people. But I wouldn't say it was that drastic. 
because even where I was in Texas during that time, there was also another Jewish community, uh, same also Orthodox Jewish. And I would go, even though I was part of the Messianic Jewish movement, I would go and hang out with them as well. And sometimes I'd spend uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the year. Um, I would spend that with them and nobody really treated me in a bad way. Um, so I, I think non-anti-Semitic and non-against Jewish sentiments, but I still felt it. It mm. wasn't until later on online where I really yeah. got the anti-Semitic feelings from a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> for those who are unfamiliar, what is the Messianic Jewish movement? Yeah, great question. Um, so Messianic Judaism is basically, it, it started in the 1980s, really, but it originates in the 1960s as well. And what that movement is, is a kind of like a revival that birthed within Christianity that was very Jewish flavored. It was very Jewish friendly. So people would wear kippah and the talit, which is the prayer shawl. They would have a lot of items and things that come from Jewish liturgy to make it more attractive to Jewish people to learn about Yeshua. And it became a hit and people were loving it. And there were so many Jewish people becoming believers in Jesus because of this movement. And basically, again, it's, it's a very Jewish style Christianity, but then that ended up evolving into something else, which was a more serious version of Messianic Judaism. Now, in that serious version, what it means is Jewish and Gentile believers in Jesus that believe that the commandments that come from Moses are binding still. So, yes, we are part of the new covenant. Yes, Yeshua is the Messiah. But in that movement, it is believed that we are still bound by those commandments. In other words, the law never changed. It's still applicable today to us. And that's essentially what it believes. And that's as far as you can take it in an overarching statement, because all the different congregations might have doctrinal differences. Like some believe in the Trinity, some do not. Some believe that you should believe the teachings of the rabbis. Some believe that that's completely against God. So because of that, there's a lot of division within the movement. But the overarching theme that unites it all is we keep the commandments and we believe in Yeshua, in essence. Yeah, and I just heard your heard your little boy in the background. <laughs> He's like, "Yeah, that's right." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so like, um, I mean, that so it's, that sounds like a very kind of interesting place to kind of you know, you, so you move from uh, you know childhood now, and then you're talking about being part of the Messianic Jewish movement, and so you know, uh, it seems as if there were competing ways in which people around you were trying to balance being Jewish and being yeah. Christian. And so yes. I'm interested in, you know, kind of, I mean, I want to kind of give you full reign now to just go into your story about how you became Catholic and, and how yeah. Catholicism has seemingly given you a way to do both in a way that you feel is authentic. And yes. so yes. How, did, how did that come about? You know, man, that is the journey that when I look at my life now, when I look back, I see how God has really been orchestrating everything. And this is how I see it. It starts all the way back with my ancestors, right? We were Jewish. I mean, we still are Jewish. Then they kind of start losing their faith. And I end up discovering lately, I just discovered this, I kid you not, last year, that some of my family members ended up becoming Catholic. One of my grandmothers actually became Catholic. And I just discovered this again, like wow. within this year. Praise God. <laughs> uh, yeah, amazing. So my father, um, when he ended up moving to the States, he became Pentecostal. So my family was raised as Pentecostal Christian throughout this whole time. What that taught me personally is to love God passionately, to love the scriptures passionately. And one thing that always stuck to me was every time my dad would preach, because he ended up becoming a, pa a pastor in the Pentecostal, in this organization within Pentecostalism. He said at the end of every message, but don't believe what I'm telling you, go to the scriptures and verify. And that really stuck with me because I, I understood at that point that 
men have their own interpretation, but we should always seek for that ultimate authority. Now, of course, now that I'm coming from a Catholic point of view, now I understand that that's also very dangerous because that can lead down the path of everyone's own interpretation, right? Uh, but from that movement, at least it taught me a passion for the word of the Lord. It wasn't until, I want to say, it's been over a decade. It's almost 12 years ago when I hit this really low point in my life and I started questioning everything. Is God real? What's the true religion? Is the Bible reliable? And I was also going through a really tough time. Personally, I didn't really have a home. This is during my college years. And I ended up living inside of the same store where I worked. So I worked in this shop where it's like, you know, those we buy gold shops that you see everywhere. So in that same store, they had a back room and that's where I lived. Really tough times that led me to, you know, just question, like, what am I doing? Am I believing what I believe just because my parents taught it to me? Or is there any truth to this? So I started researching everything. I started looking into arguments from philosophy, arguments from science, arguments from history and archaeology to find out what makes sense. And I took pretty much every religion and cult that you could think of, the major ones. So I started looking into Shinto, Buddhism, Jehovah's Witness, um, the Latter-day Saints. Uh, I started looking into Judaism and Christianity. I started looking into... Uh, Hinduism. And as I looked through all of these things, and of course, Islam as well, as I started looking through all of these things, I started seeing things that didn't make sense to me. Either their science was way off, or they had no real history, or the philosophy and theology didn't make any sense to me. And I like to think of myself as a person who bases their direction according to something that has to be logical and something that is verifiable. And I didn't see this with a lot of these things. The only thing that made sense is this God that I knew, the God of the Bible. And I wasn't trying to prove him. I was trying to just find truth. But that's the only thing that made sense because as I looked through history, archaeology, and I started seeing all of these things that made sense, I said, okay, I know that this God, the God of Israel, is the true God. Then it came to the question of, okay, so I don't know about the Bible and its reliability. Can I really count on this? So I started looking at how we even got the Bible, how we got the translations. I started looking at all the different codices that we can find. Um, I started looking at their histories. And then I came to the point where I felt a conviction that the true word of God had been preserved throughout the millennia. And even though we have different translations, the the core always remains. And at least in the Hebrew and the Aramaic and in the Greek, we have substantial evidence to prove to us that this is reliable. Then now I knew that God was real. The word was real. But what about what I was living? Does it match up? Immediately, the first thing that stood out to me as an error in my ways was the whole concept of sola fide, which is faith alone. I immediately saw that there was more to this relationship with God than just believing. And it did always seem really abstract to me. And it seemed kind of like a flimsy way of living. And I know that if somebody is Protestant out there and they hear what I'm saying now, they're going to think that's not what sola fide is. Like you taking it with a very straw man type of view You're making it seem watered down, but I'm just telling you, this is what I saw. And as I looked through the scriptures, I always saw God's emphasis in obedience, obey my commandments, keep my commandments, keep my commandments. Even when I got to the New Testament, just I I looked at the words of the Messiah, Yeshua himself was saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I'm like, okay, okay. So that's this sola fide thing. There's something wrong with it. And at the same time, as I was learning these things, I was also getting tied down back again to the roots of my heritage. So I started learning about myself as I was also learning about the faith and religion in general. 
And I started discovering more about my Jewish heritage. I started talking to my parents. I started looking at the history of our last name. I started taking DNA tests. I started asking questions about my grandparents. And when I got all of this information, I, I saw, yeah, okay, we're Jewish, but what happened? And I learned that we kind of separated from all of that when, when my parents became Protestant Pentecostals. But then as I looked at the scriptures, I said, okay, I, I'm Jewish and I need to be keeping the commandments. What do I do? Where do I go? And then two movements stood out, one of them being the Hebrew roots movement and the other one, the Messianic Jewish movement. We already explained what Messianic Judaism is. So I'll explain a little bit about Hebrew roots. And by the way, if you want to cut me off anywhere, let me know. <laughs> uh, well, I'm having a great time listening. And, and also, by the way, like um, I, I do I, at some point want to come in and just talk about a little bit of my story because I'm surprised at how much our stories are kind of overlapping. Uh, oh, it's kind of crazy, nice. you know? And so I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you finish, but man, like this is, this is incredible. <laughs> like when you said, when you said, when the Messiah said, you know, if you love me, then you'll do as I command. I'm just like, yes, yeah. you know, it's one of my favorite <laughs> passages, dude, you're preaching Same. to the choir, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that really hit me so hard. And that's, that's one of the things that became a catalyst in my life for that choice. Okay. Now what movement do I pick? Now, the other movement that I mentioned is the Hebrew roots movement similar to messianic judaism now which is we believe in yeshua but we believe in keeping the commandments it doesn't do it with a jewish flavor not necessarily they believe that anything that comes from judaism is actually against god because it separated itself from god because they don't believe in yeshua so they believe in keeping the feast they believe in keeping kosher but even in keeping kosher they make this distinction between biblically kosher and rabbinically kosher, which is actually a legitimate uh, point of view, but it basically goes only by the laws that you find in Leviticus 11, as opposed to the rabbinical laws of kashrut. Um, they also believe in um, the keeping the Shabbat and keeping the new moons. Again, within this movement, there's a lot of debate on how to interpret things. And I noticed that everywhere. So that became the next issue later on. But let me just uh, hone in into that first decision where I decided, OK, I'm going to follow Messianic Judaism because I'm Jewish and I'm a believer in Jesus. It makes sense. So I started walking that lifestyle for pretty much over a decade uh, until recently, like two years ago, really, I started kind of getting out of that. Um, but throughout this time, it really led me into looking into the Jewish roots of Christianity and I started studying a lot from Jewish ra uh, rabbis, of course. Um, I started looking at things like the Zohar, which is more in the mystical side of things. Started looking into Kabbalah. I started uh, studying the Mishnah a lot, which is birthed from the oral tradition. Ah, yes, that one. Is that by Danby, by the way? Yep, that's, that's by Danby. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's amazing. So I started really looking into the Mishnah a, a lot. And for those of you that don't know about the Talmud, it's basically extra commentary from the Mishnah. So it gets added on throughout the years. And you have two different versions. You have the Talmud Bavli and Yerushal uh, Yerushalmi, which is the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. The most accepted is the Babylonian Talmud. So that's the one that I really started kind of getting into. Uh, and then other Jewish writings. I just really started diving into Jewish literature. Also in this time, I didn't have a TV. I removed all types of distractions from my life. And all I did was just study, 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 study. And I was just diving in and I was loving it. I was learning so much. And what was great is that even as I studied all these Jewish writings that come from non-believer sources, I still started seeing how God was here, hidden, in a way that I thought if any Jewish person that reads these things ends up believing in Yeshua, they can look back at, back at their writings and say, wow, God was calling me all along, because it made sense that way. Now, that's not to say that these documents are supportive of, of Yeshua, but it does prove that God is still in there working because God, through the scriptures and through the apostle Paul says that Israel, all Israel is blind in part. So they're blinded, but they can still see a little bit. And that's what I could see throughout this. 
as I continued to study, I noticed one issue. I only studied Jewish sources that were unbelievers, people that did not believe in Yeshua. So that led me to finally ask, okay, okay, I got to slow down and I got to start looking. What did the earliest believers in Yeshua believe? Did they believe the same things that I'm practicing now? Because all along I'm practicing Messianic Judaism thinking, well, I'm seeking the ancient path, right? I want to live how the disciples lived. And this is what a lot of people's mentality is within the Hebrew roots and Messianic Jewish movements. We want to go back to what's original. Yeshua kept kosher. He wore a tzitzit uh, garment. He lived keeping the feasts all his life. The apostles did too. And you can see this in the New Testament. Like, okay, it, it made sense that they did that. Am I seeking the ancient path? But it wasn't until I really started looking into history that I noticed that I was wrong. The first writings to do this in my mind, to change everything was the Didache, which is one of the earliest writings attributed to the believers in Yeshua. Then I started looking at what are known as the church fathers. But more specifically, I wanted to look at the pre-Nicene fathers because I was taught within Messianic Judaism that after Constantine, the church became pagan. <laughs> so because of that, I'm like, okay, I got to stick away from, from the Nicene Council. I got to stay away from Constantine. And I got to look at the things that we find pre-Nicene. And then I started looking into the apostolic fathers, which are the students of the apostles. So I'm talking about people like Papias. I'm talking about things, people like Polycarp. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch is kind of one step removed. Uh, so you have John, Yohanan, and then you have Polycarp, and then you have uh, Ignatius. Um, then I started looking at Irenaeus. And then I started looking at all of these church fathers, and one thing stood out. And it freaked me out. It, they all looked very, very Catholic. I said, no, 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 this can't be. What are they talking about? Why do they keep talking about this Eucharist? Why do they keep referring to it as a real sacrifice, tying it back to the Pesach lamb? Why are they talking about this importance in baptism? I thought it was just a symbol. I thought the Eucharist was just a symbol. As I kept studying all of this, I had to come to the conclusion that, you know what, I was looking at the Catholic Church all wrong. Let me see what the Catholic Church really believes. And then my mind got blown up again, because I started realizing that the church doesn't worship the Pope. The church doesn't worship Mary as a goddess. They are not worshiping the saints. They are not just eating a random cracker, and they're not cannibals. They are the fulfillment of temple Judaism. And then when I saw that authentic fluidity between temple Judaism and the church, I saw the kingdom of Israel was never destroyed, but it was fulfilled in the Catholic church. Then I started having this debate within myself, and that's when it all really, I still didn't approve of the church yet because I saw the history as well. And I saw a lot of anti-Semitism riddled throughout the church history. It was never teachings of the church. It was people that were church members, if you will, that had these views. So I knew I couldn't condemn the church for these things because I look at the scriptures and Israel always had its faults. It always had its bad kings. And God loved his people always and preserved them. Same thing, the church is a continuation of that. And yeah, there may be stains within some people, but the church itself is preserved. And so then I started asking myself, can I even be Jewish in this place? Are they going to accept me? I feel like I'm going to get attacked or hated or treated as a leper in the outskirts of the church. And then I ended up finding about this group called Hebrew Catholics, which is basically a Jewish community's um, specifically, this one started by Elias Friedman, um, who is a Carmelite priest, and he began this movement of the Hebrew Catholics, which is Jewish people within the church in full communion with the church, but living as Jews, some of them in different extents, some of them just know that they're Jewish, some of them keep the traditions, 
Some of them, like me, might be wearing a kippa, wearing tzitzit and eating kosher, but everything is done through the lens of the Messiah and in agreement with the magisterium of the church. And when I saw that I could be Jewish and Catholic, I was like, yes, this is it. This is the truth. I see the continuation. I see how it really lines up. And then I started learning about the liturgy of the church and how temple-based it was. Man, I'm getting super hyped right now. <laughs> That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. And so, and so the church, the church didn't try to make you less Jewish, right? In in becoming a member, right? It, it, yeah. it allowed you to be as Jewish as you wanted to be, as free as you wanted to be within the within what the Messiah had done and what he had yes, built. Absolutely. It it gave me the opportunity to be authentically Jewish. Because during my yeah. time as a even as a messianic Jewish member. Uh, in that movement, I still saw the flaws within rabbinic Judaism because there was mm. also no authority. And as if you, if you notice throughout this conversation, one of the big things that started standing out to me, it wasn't just the sola fide issue. It was this issue of authority. I couldn't find it in mm, Protestant yep. Christianity. I couldn't find it in the Hebrew roots movement. I couldn't find it in Messianic Judaism. And I couldn't find it even in rabbinic Judaism. It lacked authority, mm. and it, this caused division. That's why even now within Judaism, a lot of people think of Judaism and they think it's a monolith movement. It, it hasn't been a monolith yeah. movement, mm. even in the time of Yeshua. You know, you had the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, and other smaller groups. And it wasn't just minor differences. I'm talking about big doctrinal issues. And when I go to rabbinic Judaism, you have the reformed, you have the conservative, you have the orthodox, the ultra orthodox, you have the Chabadnik, you have those who believe in a Messiah, you have those who don't believe in a Messiah. So yeah. with all of that, I saw that the church had its real authentic biblical authority. And as we spoke about before, we can trace this back to the times of the temple and the perfect story with Elia King and Shevna. So yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it allowed me really to be authentically Jewish within the church. And it was beautiful. And it, it's kind of like a weight off my shoulders, knowing that I, I can rest. Finally, I found the Shalom that I was seeking this whole time. Wow. Wow. That's beautiful. I mean, and so uh, I guess one thing that I'm interested in is just, you know, continuing that conversation on the magisterium, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, so the magisterium for you wasn't, well, it wasn't a stumbling block because for, I know for a lot of Protestants, you know, the idea of a magisterium of this institution that can teach on doctrine, on faith and morals yeah. definitively, infallibly, mm -hmm. that's a huge barrier for them. Yes. But for you, like, it was like, yeah, come on, yeah. you know, like I, I need it. Right. Yeah. So, so wh wh why do you think it wasn't so much of a barrier for you? And yeah. Um, you know, do you feel like, do you feel like being Jewish in any way and, uh, you know, and your knowledge of, you know, the Sanhedrin and how, mm -hmm. you know, Moses built the courts of Israel, did yeah. that help at all? And, yes. and, you know, being like, yeah, I feel at home. Exactly. I, that's actually literally my thought process. I took it all the way back to the time of Moshe, Moses, and he established the courts. It made sense. It was Moshe. You had the priest, the priesthood. And of course you had this magisterium type of a structure, right? where the judges, and I right now I'm recalling in the book of Deuteronomy, if you look in, in chapter 18, it tells us, uh, 16 actually, and also 18, it tells us about these judges, Levites, and priests, which were given the authority to interpret, to decree, and to judge. And I said, wait a second, the magisterium is literally the same thing. As I started looking through Jewish history, and I get to the Sanhedrin, also known as the Beit Din Hagadol, the great court, um, and Throughout all of it, it was the same thing. And I looked throughout Jewish history. Actually, if you go to the Talmud, if you go to the Mishnah as well, if you go to the section called Pirkei Avot, the, sec the first section of it, it tells us how the authority came from Moshe to Yehoshua, to the elders, to the high court, to the domain of the great court, and it goes to the Sanhedrin, and it goes then to the rabbis. But then I said, wait a second, the rabbis lost their smicha, which is the the actual authority that comes from the laying on of hands. And then that's another thing, the laying on of hands. It's completely, literally the same thing. This is what the church has been doing since Yeshua, the king of kings, the actual high priest comes into the scene and he continues that authority. 
with his apostles. And then when I looked at the magisterium, I felt right at home, like you said, because it's not a new structure. It's the ancient structure that has been here all along. So yeah, to me, it just clicked. It made perfect sense. And it gave me a relief knowing that I finally found that authority that has always been part of God's plan fulfilled in the church and the magisterium. You know, and I remember too, like uh, when I was younger, I used to read, you know, Matthew 16, 19, 18, 18, when Jesus says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, yes. you know, Asar and Hittir, right? Yes. And uh, I used to, I used to just kind of gloss over that. Like, I don't know what that means. And it's probably irrelevant. <laughs> and then, oh my gosh, like now, like, you know, reading that and realizing that that was the rabbinic power to interpret scripture and discipline the community, exactly. you know, declare the halakha, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yes. to, you know, e even like, you know, they can issue anathemas and excommunicate members with yep. that power. Yes. You know, absolutely. I mean, when you read the New Testament and you and you read those words, and I mean, were you familiar with binding and loosing and, and what that meant in Judaism? That only started making sense to me, even though this is the crazy part, even within Messianic Judaism, and we did recognize the authority of the of the courts before Yeshua. Mm. Um, they they didn't really even talk about that that much, and you couldn't. Because if you did so, you would be admitting to the fact that Messianic Judaism had a really big flaw, yeah. that missing component of authority. So they glossed over it. And I knew about it, but it wasn't really a big deal. It wasn't until, this is why I love the Catholic Church so much. It wasn't until I started learning about how the Catholic Church works that I looked back and I said, wait a second, I learned these things and this is where it's actually fulfilled. Now the scriptures make sense. And this is why Yeshua in, in Matthew 5, when he talks about that, he didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, mm -hmm. but to, you know, he came to fulfill them. It all made sense. And the, the perfect examples are what you're talking about, the binding and loosing. Um, this is rabbinic terminology, as you said, that gives them this authority. But of, of course, like I said, I wasn't going to find anybody within Protestantism or anything outside of the church that would agree with that, because then that would put them in a really awkward spot. Yeah. It would have the it would have them make this realization that their system is flawed, mm. but in yeah. the church is there. And and so Daniel, did you struggle at all with you know things like the Eucharist being the actual you know body and blood of Christ, you know his blood, soul, and uh, body, soul, and divinity, or were you kind of like, hey, you know he he is the Passover lamb, so I'm going to eat him, you know, like well, what what was that like? Okay, so. Uh, it's funny before when you, you mentioned a lot of, uh, especially Protestants, struggle with the magisterium and the papacy. Mm -hmm. To me, that was literally one of the easiest, <laughs> most welcomed doctrines, right? Wow. And teachings of the church. But when I got to the Eucharist, mm. and then uh, later on, Marian doctrine, which we'll talk about later. Yeah, we'll do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when I got specifically to this point, the Eucharist, I was really bothered by it. And I didn't accept it so easily at first. It made sense um, that it was seen as a sacrifice, but that it was really Yeshua. It took me really diving back into Judaism to understand it because I started looking at, for example, um, every Pesach, every Passover, we read from this uh, book. You know, every community has um, specific things that are a little bit different, but in essence, the Ashkenazi one. It tells us to, when we partake of the Pesach, that meal, the Pesach Seder, to not think of it as if you're removed from the ancient uh, Pesach, but rather that you are transported literally, not just imaginatively, but you're literally taken back and you're partaking of that. That was a key for me to understand that God is timeless. We live in a timeline, but God is timeless. And thus, that Jewish mentality of being there, not just separated, but you're partaking of the same thing, it made perfect sense when the church taught me that we're not re-sacrificing Yeshua in the sacrifice of the, of the mass, but that rather we are taken to that very same point in Calvary. We're time travelers, basically. Because we are not doing this sacrifice simply based on our terms, but because we recognize that this is God offering God to God through the sacrifice 
that we see here through the Eucharist. So then I was able to understand, okay, this is truly timeless. And then I went back to John 6, which as you know, the bread of life discourse. And I saw how difficult it was for these Jews also to accept that this was really the body and blood of Yeshua that we had to consume if we wanted eternal life. So it was difficult, but the more I started looking and what really helped me was looking at Jewish tradition, like I mentioned this um, Haggadah, this Jewish book for the Pesach. And then I started looking at ancient Judaism and the how it was viewed in terms of Pesach. Then I started looking at what the actual church teaches in the New Testament. So I took all of that together and I was able to understand that it really is a sacrifice and that it really has to be, obligatorily has to be the body and blood of Yeshua. Otherwise, it's not a sacrifice. Otherwise, it's not going to do what Yeshua said and allow us to access eternal life. So yeah, I finally ended up agreeing with it. And that was really the main catalyst that really made me say, okay, now I need to be part of the Catholic Church because where else am I going to get this? Am I going to get it from these guys who think that it's just a cracker and grape juice? Am I going to get it from this group that even though we, and I'm talking about Messianic Judaism, we do the bread and the challah, we have the bread and wine, we do this every week, but to us, it was just a symbol also. Or do I go to these folks that actually believed what Yeshua said, that it really was his body, blood, soul, and divinity? And it was a clear choice for me. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, what was it? You know, like, uh, I remember, I I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Dr. Brant Petrie. Of course. I mean, like when he did uh, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist and, and all that. Oh, yeah, yeah man. Yeah. You, got, you got the book? I, I have to. This was also a big component that helped me to understand that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, cause like, you know, they'll talk about like, um, you know, the, the, the father will, um, will ask the son a question. You know, you like, it's something like, do you know, son, why we celebrate the Passover? Yes. And then the son asks, and then the father answers, you know, for it was, I, I was delivered on that night in Egypt. Yes. Right. And then it's like, it's so then like the past never died. It never went away. The past and the present become one reality through this ritual, through the sacrament. Yes. Right. And so, man, that's just, yeah. That, yeah. I mean, that, that blew my mind. And, you know, like when Jesus says, remember me, mm -hmm. you, the, the Jewish idea of remembrance was not this kind of intellectual kind of grasp. Right. And, or in recollection, it was, it was an actual reenactment of that reality in a, in yeah. a way, uh, or a reentry right. rather into that reality. Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, um, so, you know, looking into Judaism, then, um, you know, people have talked about the sacraments having a Jewish origin, yeah. and that even, you know, even the Old Testament, like physical objects were used to manifest the grace of God to manifest his power, yeah. you know, like the high priest, what the vestments and the garments that he wore, they actually were significant, they actually did certain things. Yes. Uh, can you talk about that? Like the, the, the Jewish roots of the sacraments? Yeah, well, in Judaism, even today, um, there is a belief that the physical world is not detached from the spiritual world. It's in a very real way connected. Uh, one of the examples of this is even something that I have now in my house at the doorpost of my house is called a mezuzah. Uh, for those of you who do not know what a mezuzah is, it comes from the book of Deuteronomy, um, where it tells us to write the words of the Lord or to keep his word in the doorposts of our house. And the rabbinic um, world took this in a very literal sense, and they would take a scroll of that very same segment of the Shema, which is one of the most, the most important prayer in Judaism. It's a little scroll with scripture in it. You roll it up and you put it inside a little container and that gets attached to the doorpost of your home to literally take this scripture uh, literal, because we understood that the spiritual and the physical is in a very real way connected. Another example of this uh, is if you see Jews that have this little black box here on their forehead and the one that's attached to their arm and wrapped in the hand, that's called tefillin. Uh, tefillin is uh, also taking a very literal interpretation of what we find in scriptures where it tells us to keep the word of God uh, between our eyes as frontlets between our eyes and on your hands, right? It, it can also be taken in a symbolic manner, right? Whatever you think and whatever you do. Uh, do you but know, it was always so literal. 
Yeah. Do you know if Jesus uh, also wore that? Because I read, I think I read somewhere in a commentary that it's very probable that he would have worn it during yeah. that time. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. So from, from what I've been able to gather in studies, there is actual evidence. And okay, this is really funny because uh, within the Messianic Jewish movement, you know how I told you how there are some groups that are more rabbinic and some that are, say, not rabbinic? Mm -hmm. There was a huge debate that ended up surging because a while back, there was actually some archaeological digs that were done in the land of Israel, and they ended up finding actual ancient, from the time of Yeshua, um, tefillin that was actually preserved. And it looked pretty much exactly what like tefillin looked like now. And if Yeshua was a practicing Jew, which he obviously was, he yeah. had to be, uh, then he would have been doing these things. He was going to synagogue every Shabbat. We know yeah. that he was wearing tzitzit because if you look at the scriptures where it tells us about the woman with the issue of blood that holds mm -hmm. on to the garment, what do you think she's holding on to? Her, his pants? He wasn't wearing pants. He was wearing uh, the talit, right? Uh, of course, he was wearing other garments. But what I mean yeah. is that specific thing it imparts grace. Um, and Yeshua must have definitely be doing these things. Another, uh, another factor that allows us to acknowledge the fact that Yeshua was completely and thoroughly a Jew in his community, for you to be able to attend synagogue, and these synagogues in specific, you were most likely going to be a Pharisee. The Pharisees actually got along well with Yeshua more than people would believe. Right. Mm -hmm. I know in the scriptures, a lot of people think that Yeshua and the Pharisees were enemies, but rather if, if Yeshua is a loving teacher, he's going to instruct his children and he's going to instruct his people. This is why we find in scripture, you know, where it tells us, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. This is where it comes from, from the book of Proverbs. So he came here to correct his people because he, we, he, he knew that they had some errors, but it doesn't mean that everything they did was wrong. Hmm. It just means that they had some flaws that they had to straighten up. This is why so many Pharisees ended up becoming believers in Yeshua. They actually had a lot of very similar theology. Uh, we see this with Paul too, when he was in the court and he saw, he recognized that there was a division uh, between the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, but the Pharisees do. So he uses that argument and then they start bickering amongst themselves. And that's how he is able to get out of the situation. Super <laughs> smart move. All, all of that to basically say that, yeah, even Shaul was a Pharisee. He says this in the scriptures and Yeshua was raised in a tradition that was most likely very Pharisaic. Right. Not to say that he was in accordance to everything, because right. we know that later on he challenges the Pharisaic authorities. But in reality, most of what he did was in that same way of walking. Yeah, I mean, I just I find it really unfortunate that, you know, so many Christians, when they read the New Testament, they, they just think that the Pharisees were these horrendous evil people and Jesus totally, yeah. you know, hated them and, you know, undid all their theology. When in reality, like his critique was a lot more nuanced yes. and a lot of them don't, a lot of the people that I've talked to, they don't want to learn about the nuance of, of Jesus' mm -hmm. critique of the Pharisees. And that's been a huge problem in terms of, um, you know, preventing anti-Semitism by understanding Absolutely. what Jesus was really trying to say about the Pharisees. Yeah. And so on and so, so forth. True. Absolutely. That's a huge point, man. And I'm really glad that you bring that up because that's one of the issues that I think the church still faces today, which is they don't understand how, why Yeshua spoke so harshly to the Pharisees. He didn't hate the Pharisees. He loved them dearly. And this is why he was trying to correct them because he wanted to bring them in because of this harsh hand with which Yeshua brought his message. This is why we go to the book of Acts and we see in chapter 20, verse 21, that it tells us about all these believing Jews, Yaakov, Jacob. Um, he was the bishop right there in Jerusalem. And when Paul comes back from his journeys and he comes all the way back to Jerusalem, Paul is over here telling the elders, wow, look at all these great things that are happening amongst the Gentiles. So many people to coming to believe in God and believing in Yeshua. And then Yaakov, Jacob, oh no, wait, 
James, that's how you say it in English. <laughs> yeah. James says, mm -hmm. yeah, that's amazing. I'm, I'm so happy that all these things are happening. But check this out. Even in Jerusalem, also, we have so many people coming into faith in Yeshua. And they're zealous for the Torah. So these are Jewish people living as Jews, like myself, right? But they are passionate about Yeshua as well, which means there was no contradiction. It was a fulfillment. So while Paul is over here preaching to the Gentiles, what do you think that, that Yaakov was preaching to here in Jerusalem? It wasn't a place riddled with Gentiles. It was a place riddled with Jews. And these Jews became believers. And the majority of them were Pharisees. Of course, this shouldn't be misconstrued to be thinking that everything that the Pharisees believed was okay. Because remember, these are the same people that were trying to tell the Gentiles that they had to become circumcised before giving themselves to Yeshua. We end up finding in the, in the book of uh, Acts chapter 15 that that's not a necessary thing for, for Christians to do, especially if you're coming from a Jewish, uh, from a Gentile background. So yeah, it's, it's sad that um, there has been this wrong view. And as a matter of fact, even within Catholic circles, I've noticed that if you are someone who loves tradition, uh, and if you love, for example, if you love Vatican I, uh, people will call you a Pharisee. And I said, that's not an insult. <laughs> we are taking it to mean an insult, but that's not the way that it should be seen because it's not every Pharisee that was in wrong. A lot of the leadership was in error and uh, many of the followers would have been in error too, but it doesn't mean that in essence, being Pharisee equals being evil. If that makes sense. Yeah, because people have also talked to me about, I think there was a book actually by Harvey Falk called Jesus the Pharisee. And it made the mm. argument that Jesus actually aligned more with the school of uh, Hillel than Shammai yeah. or something yeah. like that. I don't know how familiar you are with that. but uh... Yeah, I, I don't know about that work, but that is actually something that was well known, even within a lot of the congregations that I ended up visiting with within Messianic Judaism. And even some non Jewish believing rabbis would say the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Rabbi Shmuley. He's mm, from Very our familiar. times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he actually, he's a good friend with a, a Protestant Jewish believer in Jesus, Dr. Brown. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So he wrote the book, the kosher Jesus. And he talks about this same thing that Jesus really lined up with this mentality from the Hillel school of thought within the pharisaic movement mm -hmm. so yeah yeah okay well dude i've been dude i've been having a blast and so let's move mm -hmm. on now to just talking about mm -hmm. the blessed mother because i mean yeah. okay so we talked about the eucharist we talked about the magisterium another yeah. big one that um you know a lot of protestants have a problem with is, is the blessed mother and i don't know like i've never i've never heard how you know from someone of a jewish background how they you know kind of how one would approach the blessed mother and so how yeah. did how did she kind of reach you or how does she you know uh affect you that's the best that way. way yeah I, I like the reaching part and you'll see why in a little bit mm -hmm. um it was really the hardest thing for me to grasp out of every teaching every teaching in the catholic church this was the hardest one to grasp because remember i'm not just coming in from a jewish background but i'm also coming in with a little bit a little bit of that protestant mentality and i was raised thinking in a very anti-Catholic fashion, that Catholics worshipped Mary, medium. If you hear me call her medium, that's why it's uh, her Hebrew name. I thought that Catholics worshipped her, that she was a goddess. First of all, this was completely off. But even after I understood, okay, Catholics really don't worship her. They just really venerate her. They honor her. It was really hard for me to grasp because there was way too much love for her. And it seemed a little bit unbalanced to me. It seemed wrong, um, but it's again, because I was looking at it through a Protestant lens, it took me going back again. And this is a, a recurring theme. I have to look at it through the Jewish lens for Catholicism to make sense. Isn't that crazy to understand Catholicism? You can't see it through the Protestant lens. You have to do yeah. Jewify it. <laughs> is that even a word? Jew <laughs> <laughs> That's how I can actually understand it. So when it came to the Blessed Mother, Another book by Dr. Brant Petrie is Jesus and the Jewish Roots of Mary. Amazing book, which takes me back to seeing Miriam, the Blessed Mother, 
through the lens of typology. Typology, for anybody who doesn't know, it's observing the New Testament and its components and teachings of the church through the lens of and in comparison to the Old Testament scriptures and through history. An example of this is you have the Ark of the Covenant. And if you read in the book of 2 Samuel and you read about how the procession, right, where they were carrying the Ark, it, the men slip a little bit and this guy Uza goes to try to stop it and dead in an instant because he was not worthy to touch this super holy object. Then we go to the Blessed Mother and we find out that the church teaches us that she was an ever virgin. I didn't see this when I read the scriptures, even though the scriptures don't say that she ended up having children. When it, it doesn't say she had children, it tells us about Yeshua's brothers, which that's another topic for another day, but they are not really his blood brothers. This shouldn't be mysterious to us. You know, we call each other bro all the time, right? Or even within Christians, you call them brothers. Anybody who's close to you, you call them a brother. Same thing. But in any case, I saw that the church taught me that she was an ever virgin. And it took me looking at that typology to understand that she was so holy. The one who bore Yeshua within her womb, which is the bread of life. Yeshua is the bread of life. The ark carried the manna, which is the heavenly bread. The ark also carried the tablets of stone, which are the word of God. And Yeshua, which was who Miriam bore, was the word of God made flesh. It also tells us in the scriptures that the ark contained the budding rod of Aaron, which is the symbol of the priesthood. And then Miriam carried the priest, the high priest himself within her womb. The, the similarities are uncanny. Then we go and we look at the fact that uh, it tells us that Miriam w went and stayed with Elizabeth for those three months. And we also find out that the Ark stayed in the house of Obed Edom for three months. We find out that David said, how is it that the Ark of the Lord shall come to me? And then we find that Elizabeth says, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So it's, it's just undeniable. Then we find out later on, and this was the queen of heaven was the last issue for me to target, which was why do Catholics, okay, she's the mother of God, not a problem, right? Elizabeth says, how is it that the mother of my Lord, God, right, should come to me? So mother of God, check, easy. Ark of the covenant, check. Ever virgin because of the Ark of the covenant, check. Queen of heaven? That really, really became difficult to me. But again, go back to the Jewish way of thinking. Who was the queen in the structure of Israel's kingdom? It was the mother that was the queen, not the wife of the king. The king sometimes had multiple wives. But it was the mother of the king to whom people would go to when they wanted something from the king. And we find this in the book of Kings. When people go to... Uh, the mother of King Solomon asked her for a request because they know that the king will not refuse her. And then the church is over, over here seeking for the intercession of the queen mother, the queen of heaven and earth, because she is the mother of our Lord, right? So it makes sense that if Yeshua is king, she is queen. If back in Israel, people went to the queen mother for intercession. It makes sense that we go to her for intercession. Now, all of these things I say, because then when I went to the Jewish way, it made sense. But I still really struggled with grasping it in my heart. It made logical sense. And this is why now I love the Blessed Mother so much. Because through her, through her, I was humbled to the point that I understood, it doesn't matter how much knowledge you get. It doesn't matter how many connections you can make intellectually, how great your typology and your knowledge of it is, how many books you read and how many facts you've gathered, how much you know about Jewish history. It won't matter until you open up your heart. And I'll tell you why. And this is why I said that it's interesting that you said that she reached out. It wasn't until I went to God and I said, God, I see that everything that you're giving me through the church makes sense, but I'm really struggling with this medium situation. 
if you really want me to believe what the church is teaching, you have to soften my heart because I cannot grasp it. I need you to help me. If you want me to embrace this, teach me. If not, take me away from the church because this is not making sense. As I started to pray this more and more, I got this really strong urge to get a rosary. Before, in the, back in my days, I used to think that the rosary was vain repetition, right? And that it was an idol. But for some reason, now I had this really strong urge to get myself a rosary. So I did it. I bought it and I got a rosary. I didn't pray it. I just had it with me. And then I felt like a calling. You have to pray the rosary. You have to pray the rosary. Finally, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to do it. And I started praying the rosary. And at first, I'm like, okay, wow, this is interesting. It's recitation of scripture, and I'm meditating on the life of Mashiach. This is great. Then it led me to the point where I'm like, okay, now I feel comfortable enough to actually finally go to a church. Now, of course, we live in the time where every church was shut down, right? Because of the health situation in the world. So I ended up having to go online and like sign up and register for me to be able to go. And I do it. And that night was my first real encounter with the Blessed Mother. Now, this is this, it goes into the realm of private revelation, if you will. But I really was impacted this night because the same night that I made that RSVP, yes, I'm coming to, to my first mass ever. I'm, I signed up. I'm ready to go. That night, I go to sleep. And I had the most wonderful vision because I was in this half asleep, half awake moment. And I, I saw the church where I was going to go in my mind. Uh, it was like a vision, right? I see the church. I see so many happy families. I see children walking in the church. Everybody's happy and everybody's welcoming me, even though I'm Jewish. Remember, I was still struggling with this. Uh, so many people are being so nice to me and I'm right was here for my first mass. And as I'm there seeing all these happy people getting ready for the sacrifice of the mass, I hear. No, in a better way, I feel the blessed mother tell me I'm happy for you. And it was it was the most wonderful thing because I knew it was her. Remember, I've been struggling with this whole Marian thing, but I knew it was her. And I didn't hear her voice. I felt her voice. And that was the first time that I had an encounter. Later on, and maybe we can talk about this in other conversations, I had other situations where I felt the Blessed Mother and her presence there with me, pulling me in. And I understood, again, that it's not about head knowledge. It's about the heart. And that's where the Blessed Mother has caused the biggest impact for me in the, web, in the walk of Catholicism. Because I really had to humble myself. Again, as I said in the very beginning of our conversation, I always considered a, uh, myself as a person who bases their decisions upon logic and factuality and evidence. But I learned now that that wasn't enough. The component of the heart is the most essential part. Because if your heart is not in it and only your head, then you'll never be in full, con in full connection with God. He wants your heart. He wants your mind. He wants your body. And this is what I found in Catholicism. We look back. Uh, we were talking about the mezuzah, the scripture that's in it. It tells us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength, your body, right? And this is what the church does. It doesn't just take your heart. It doesn't just take your mind. It doesn't just take your body. It takes everything. The church is physical. You have the sacraments that are physical. The church is mental. It's the most intellectual body I've ever seen. Everything is so connected and rich. Think of St. Thomas Aquinas. Everything is about the heart. Everything is about devotions, devotions to Yeshua through the saints and through Miriam. That scripture finally made sense when I understood what the Catholic Church teaches. And it took the Blessed Mother to take me to that point. <sighs> Amazing stuff. Ah. Wow, that's incredible, man. Wow. Man, I think this is um I think this is, I think this is a good place to stop, you know, and, and we can we can pick up this conversation maybe on, on your channel and and, and also yeah. and elsewhere. But 
Uh, Daniel, is there anything else that you feel like you should share about your story or any anything that you feel like really needs to be said? I mean, because right there, right then and there, you kind of just knocked it out of the park, man. I mean, it's <laughs> beautiful. But is there anything else? Um, I guess what I would like to say is um, in regards to the Jewish people in particular, I think it's time for the church to really start recognizing that the Jewish people are coming back and we need to get ready for that. And what I mean by that is, number one, remove any type of anti-Semitic ideologies that you may have. And if you at any point you feel a, a certain type of way, as they say nowadays, against the Jewish people, it's time to realize that our blessed mother is Jewish. The apostles, Jewish. Yeshua, Jewish. Soften your heart because the Jewish people are coming. And this is this is part of scripture. And this is what the even the Catholic Church teaches. The scriptures tell us what, that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, the Jewish people will start coming back in droves. And we're coming back. So open up your heart and help us pray for the Jewish people and let us become vehicles of grace to the people that are seeking God. Because it's not just the Jewish people. Other people that are non-believers are in desperate need of our Messiah. Also, get acquainted with the Jewish roots of your faith. This is why I'm so glad, glad for people like you, Sona, with your amazing work, that there's really not too many people talking about the Jewish roots of Catholicism, but you're there doing it. I'm here doing it. Dr. Brant Petrie's out there doing it. Um, I have a buddy of mine that's doing it too. His name is Dustin Quick. Um, and little by little, these things are starting. You'll see that more of these things are coming up, right? I, I said to you in our conversation, uh, in our previous conversation, that the same time that you had that video with Matt Frad, I was publishing a video literally with the same topic, which leads me to believe with my whole heart that God is really calling his Jewish people back. And he's calling the church to connect itself back to its roots, to remember that the church is not separated from ancient Israel. We're connected and we are the fulfillment of it. So connect yourself to that to recognize the kingdom of God is here. We are connected and we're about to go to a new level. Um, that's all I want to say. And also, I just want to thank you. Thank you for having me here. And I can't wait to have you in my channel to dig into these type of things a little bit more. Wow. Daniel Suazo, thank you so much for coming on to my show. Once again, this is Daniel Suazo, right? Did I say that right? Yes, you got it. You got all it. Right. Suazo, <laughs> uh, the Jewish Catholic, uh, please subscribe to his YouTube channel. Uh, you have a podcast, right? Is there any other way that we can reach you? Your Patreon, you know? Uh... I don't. I don't have a Patreon. Um, you know, maybe God willing, in the future, if, mm -hmm. if my content is of value to anyone, that would be appreciated. Oh, it's already Anyhow. a value. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I guess the the best ways to reach out to me is, like you said, you can find my content in YouTube under the Jewish Catholic. You can find me on Instagram under the same tag, at the Jewish Catholic. Um, my email, pretty much the same thing, the Jewish Catholic official at gmail.com. Um, and those are pretty much the best ways to reach out to me. If anybody has any questions, I'm always ready to answer questions. So feel free to reach out and just pray for my family and I. We're still in the process of being in full communion with the church. That's another thing I wanted to mention. I'm still in the process of catechesis. Oh, really? Because, yes, because of the fact oh. that this whole situation to help remember my this is crazy too look we i should have said this before but through this whole <laughs> process of me discovering catholicism has been in the time where the church has been shut down oh, wow. so i haven't been able to go to rcia until recently mm. because now the church started to open and they finally allowed me to come in uh and it was a kind of an extraordinary situation uh for even the priest so i've been going between these two priests to their handling my situation, if you will. And they had to do one-on-one -on -one because I'm in a different category from the Japanese people who don't believe in God at all that are trying to go into the church. Right. So yeah. it's different levels. So they I've have to be one-on-one -on -one with a specific priest. Um, and my family's in this process now. We're still in the, you know, what are we called? Catechumens, I guess is what you would call yep. us. Catechumens. Mm -hmm. So in do heart- a, Do you have a sponsor? <laughs> Um, that's all in the, pro um, technically I do, 
Okay. Yes, technically I do. Uh, and it's a Japanese gentleman who's been with me through this whole process, mm -hmm. communicating with this priest because one of them is a Japanese priest and the other one is Romanian. Mm -hmm. Neither of them speak English. Uh, and my Japanese is not good enough to talk about this type of spiritual stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's been with me all along. So thank God for that guy. Oh man, that's wonderful, man. And like, yeah, uh, yeah. I really can't wait until you're confirmed and everything. And, you know, it took me, I, I was delayed a few months here in the U S before I could uh, take my first communion. And uh, uh, it was a, it was months before I could have the, pr the precious blood of Christ, but still like oh. it was worth okay. it, man. And do it. When you have oh. that first communion, it's, I'll just tell Man. you this, like, you know, when I come on your show, I'll tell you my conversion story, but I'll just tell yes. you this story and then I'll, and then we, we can, we can stop. But like, uh, yeah. when I had my first communion, I remember I bit down on the body, you know, the, the, the body of Christ. And when I bit down, I just, I heard this very visceral crunch. And the oh. first thing that appeared in my head were the bones of Christ being broken on the cross from, wow. from the weight of the crucifixion and, and, you know, the nails and wow. It was just like, Oh, oh. Wow, man, I can't wait for that moment. And I can't wait for us to have our conversation over my channel so you can share your story as well. All right, well, I'll talk to you later, Daniel. All right, brother. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for everyone watching.